Hi everyone, I'm Somi Aryan, founder of the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology. You're about to watch our first conference, which was held on September 10th, 2020. I will now give you a quick overview of the format and the concept so that uh, you know what to expect. We are calling this a think tank, but the term is used loosely as it's not what you would expect from a traditional kind of think tank structure. We start with a basic hypothesis, which I put forward, and then I bring in experts from different fields to examine that. Each expert has three minutes to share their remark on the category that they represent, and then we will have a Q&A session. My team and I will then take the sum of the discussions and turn it into a report to share with all the think tank members. The report will include suggestions on new business ventures, research areas and opportunities that the members can explore to lead change in their own environment. In addition, we are building a platform called Fem Talent, where women will be able to showcase their talent, find new career opportunities, gain investment and access training and education to upskill themselves and also have a marketplace to sell products and services that benefit women. Now, here's my hypothesis for starting this movement. When we look at the decision makers in any field from science, technology to politics, economy and academia, women are absent in the very top tier. Our aim is to explore why this is the case, what are the historical roots of this discrepancy and how technology can help us change this narrative. Most importantly, what can we do as women and as individuals to create change? Because if we wait for governments and corporations, we could be waiting a very long time. My suggestion is that the roots of this inequality go back to a restriction in the flow of information about women and to women. That's why we call it unconscious bias. I argue that all human experience is the result of three elements, nature, nurture, and the self. Nature is our biology, our DNA, which defines our mental and physical potentiality. Nurture is driven by our environment, which includes culture, education, law, politics, economy, workplace, and technology. The self is our free will, which allows us to impact our biology and our environment. We may not have complete control over our biology and environment, but we co-create our destiny with the universe. Now, information is the glue that binds the nature and environment and self. Think about information as like a bee or some kind of insect that moves between flowers and helps the pollination process. Without information, or in other words, without knowledge and data, the self cannot impact its biology or its environment because you cannot change what you don't know. For women, the challenge starts with biology at the most fundamental level, where mother nature designed them to be the childbearing sex. The disparity in the flow of information and knowledge to women began with our hunter-gatherer ancestors, where men went out to hunt and women remained in the base. Men had to collaborate and compete and build tools, all of which led to the generation of knowledge, development of technology, and gaining valuable data which was not then shared with women. They say knowledge is power, and the male dominance in the Homo sapiens is a great example of this. The biological effects of childbirth, menstruation, and menopause, and the environmental effect of unpaid labor around the house limited women's time, their freedom of movement, education, and self-development. Even in our 21st century society, this restriction of data flow still happens. For example, although some women sit on the board of companies or political organizations, the majority of deals happen when men socialize outside of those environments in their evening clubs where women are not present, both for cultural and practical reasons. So I suggest that to tackle the lack of female representation in the top tier, we first need to acknowledge the problem of restriction of data and information to women and about women, which is why we're starting the conference with this category before diving into biology, environment, and the self. So let's dive right into the conference and I hope you enjoy hearing from our wonderful panelists. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Speaking of information, I'm going to invite to the stage Tony Fish, who is our first guest. Tony specializes in data and judgment and complexity, and he will discuss a historical trend 
of data gap that has held women back. Tony recognizes that this gap is now increasing as algorithms enter uh, every aspect of our decision making. So Tony, can you tell us please some examples of how data gap works? What does it mean? And what are some of the long-term risks of failing to address this issue? I, I will indeed. Thank you, Somi, for this and for organising. It's fantastic. And I hope this finds everyone who's listening well, given the, the current crisis that we all face. You will have already noticed um, and made three correct assumptions, uh, white, male and affluent. What you cannot see or determine is that my brain does not work in the way that's perceived as normal. Your eyes do not allow you to see that my dyslexia, extreme dyslexia, or my autism or my ADHD the system may not bias against my color or my gender, but it certainly does against who I am, how I think, and how I understand things. The white male system that's been built is built for and by white males who think alike, behave alike, speak alike, and have gained an education in the same top schools and universities. It's been built by them over generations, building in more bias towards their kind. Today, me, and my data is rejected as an outlier, as the last outlier in the Sixth Sigma, making up the last one thousandth of a percent. I don't comply with the system and the system has rejected me. Reading Invisible Women, exposing data bias in a world designed for men by Caroline Cardio Perez was just fantastically eye opening. It is a brilliant book and I bought it for my two daughters and then apologised for all men. It is not just designed by men, for men, but the very foundations, structures, hierarchies, processes, procedures, standards, and system we have is fit for men by whom have designed it and have since complied. It's critical to understand that the system rejects so much non-complying data, race and gender and mind, but that is not the story. How we change the infrastructure that now collects and accumulates more of the same data, reinforcing the same bias is the reality of what we are facing. As we rush headlong into a digital world, the more data we have and the more data automation we create, built on the same biased data sets designed to increase efficiency for those who match the algorithm, I find that my data has become my foe. My data has become my enemy. Now, I know I'm lucky. Visually, I was not judged by the system because I was white and male. So I did not have to contend with the issues of race or gender. But now we're in a data first world, I find I'm too judged. Not by others, but by the invisible system that's built on somebody else's data. I don't want sympathy. I have not suffered, but I do want to be part of a solution to start about talk about the data gap. Yes, it's gender. Yes, it's race, but it's also mind. How we think differently together is what makes us human. Thanks, Somi. Thank you, Tony. That was really good, eloquently put. So our next guest is um, Dr. Bartlish, the founder of a biotech company that's researching a potential breast cancer vaccine. Uh, she will discuss how women's only issues are not always studied or validated as our general health concerns. So this is quite important, right? If it's if something is a women's only issue is not even um, acknowledged quite the same way. So yeah, so we, we talk a lot about the gender gap in wage pay and education, but there's very little awareness of the gender gap in healthcare, which really does exist. Women's health issues suffer from a variety of disadvantages that can be classified as limitations in availability, education, and even coverage, meaning who pays for it. A good example that demonstrates all three types of these disadvantages is postpartum abdominal wall reconstruction. What does that mean in English? That means if you need to have your belly wall reconstructed after you've had multiple children, where you go from there. A lot of women who've had children will have a combination of cosmetic and functional problems with their bellies. It can range from bulges to back pain, can contribute to incontinence, general core weakness, difficulty in doing regular things like yoga. It can affect almost every aspect of their daily lives and impact their overall function. When they ask their obstetricians or doctors what they can do, there's often, they're often told there's nothing you can do to help. The answer they get a lot is, well, what do you expect? You've had children. 
They try to go research it themselves, and there's very little useful, useful, much less organized information that can direct them on where to go or what to do. Then if they finally do stumble into someone who can say, yes, I have something I can do to offer to help you, then they try to get the procedure covered by insurance and they get denied because it's not acknowledged as medically necessary. There isn't even in these instances a code you can use, which is required to start the conversation with the insurance company to begin with. Then another example is breast reductions. Some cases, women have extraordinarily large breasts that impact their daily activities also. They can't find clothing that fits. They can't find bras that fits. Their, their bras are $200 a piece. They can't exercise properly to maintain their overall health. Sometimes they have chronic neck and back pain. Sometimes they're on pain medication every day. And they will routinely get refused coverage for the procedure that takes a couple of hours that can solve the problem unless they jump through multiple hoops, like seeing a chiropractor or physical therapist for a year and a half before the procedure, even though we all can acknowledge that no matter how much physical therapy you get, it's not going to shrink your breasts and solve the problem. Then if you compare that and you consider the fact that for general, in general speaking terms of rehabilitation, if you look at most gender neutral conditions like sports injuries or other things like that, there are very specific rehabilitation protocols that get you back where you need to be after you suffer from those conditions. But if you look at the condition that affects the most number of organ systems and has the most life altering impact on you, which is pregnancy, there's no rehabilitation system for that that's, rec that's recognized. If you compare that to male specific problems, such as erectile dysfunction, penile implants are covered by all insurance. So overall, you can see there's a significant gap and by and large, women manage their unique healthcare issues with less research, less guidance and less financial support than they should have the paradox is, as we gain an influence and achieve professionally, there's almost an expectation that we manage those concerns on our own or behave as if they don't exist. The only solution is to effectuate change amongst ourselves from within. Thank you, Dr. Barsish. That was mind-blowing to think that there is such a huge level of gap between what is covered and what is not covered when it comes to women. So next we have uh, Dr. Sophia Yen. So Dr. Yen is, um, uh, she's a clinical associate professor at Stanford. Uh, she is the CEO and co-founder of Pandia Health, birth control uh, delivery, and has uh, 20 plus years experience in medicine, uh, and she has a passion for women's health. Dr. Yen, one of the earliest experiences of life for women is menstruation. Now, can you please tell us, in your opinion, how you think this aspect of female biology has historically impacted women's socioeconomic progress and their position in the business and political or even academic realm? Thank you so much for having me here today. It's such an honor. And I just wanted to say, you know, did you know the number one cause of missed school and work in women under the age of 25 is men? The number one cause of anemia in a menstruating woman, menstruation. By having fewer periods, women can decrease their risk of ovarian, endometrial, and colorectal cancer. Without medication, women should have a period every month. However, with medication or hormonal treatment, we can end that random burden that hits women one week out of four. I realized this trying to get pregnant. The only reason that those with uteri bleed every month is that we, were, we didn't get pregnant. So every month from age 12 to 50, 12 in the westernized states or modernized high nutrition states, we build a lining, wait for an embryo. If an embryo doesn't happen, we bleed. And we build and we bleed and we build and we bleed. And every time you build, you risk endometrial cancer. Every time you pop out an egg, you risk ovarian cancer. And how do you have fewer periods? You can use the IUD with hormone, the implant, the shot, the vaginal ring, the patch, um, as well as the birth control pill. It's more predictable if you use the ring, the patch, or pill. The risks it's important that women realize is that extra estrogen exposure in the pill patch ring increases your risk of breast cancer. However, um, the benefits of decreased endometrial, ovarian, and colorectal cancer outweigh that increased risk of breast cancer, as well as the benefit of decreasing landfill and improving quality of life for women. Those with uteri use 10,000 to 13,000 menstrual products on average in their lifetime. So hopefully people will go to more greener options such as menstrual cups. 
we could decrease this down to a third. And people say, oh, that's not natural to have fewer periods. However, what's not natural is this incessant menstruation. Currently, the Dogon tribe in Mali has about 100 periods in their lives. However, those of us in more first world countries have 350 to 400. And that's because they begin their periods at age 15, 16. We begin our periods at age 12. They have eight periods a year. We have 13. They have eight babies a year. Not saying we should do that, but we have two babies a year or in our lifetimes, not a year, so sorry. And then breastfeeding, they feed 12 to 18 months. Awesome. We breastfeed for zero, three, or six months. And therefore, we have three and a half to four times the amount of periods that we should. What we need is more options for turning on and off our periods. Currently, there's only one implant, two rings, and one type of hormonal IUD, but there are seven to eight progestins. And then menopause is currently being treated with two separate hormones when it could be one, and there is only one pill for that. And then lastly, we need research. Far more money put into research, different side effects of different birth control pills and the long-term effect of these kinds of methods. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yen. Uh, that was uh, eye-opening. We will get to uh, technology and uh, uh, politics and economy, but I wanted to have biology in the beginning because I felt like it, it all starts with that. And that's the thing that has historically been used to discriminate or you know, that's where it all starts, basically. So. Um, our next uh, guest is Dr. Austin. Disclaimer, she's also my doctor. I <laughs> highly, highly recommend her. <laughs> so Dr. Austin, you are a nutritionist and I know that you have a passion for hormones. You are also a GP. So can you please tell us how do hormones affect a woman, both in terms of their mental and physical health and throughout their lives? Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm happy to be here and well, you know, well done for setting this up. Um, I think, you know, Sophia and, and um, Sophie um, had some very valid points. And if you if you start with the menstruation, um, it's starting at um, earlier ages now. And you're talking sometimes it can be as considered normal to start your period at as young as seven years old, would you believe? Um, so times are changing and we don't know why this is. And um, the fact that when women and girls start their periods, it can be more heavier. They can be, um, you know, trying to balance their hormones out um, when they start menstruating and go through puberty. Um, and actually, um, so um, Sophia had some valid points that actually in the UK, there was a survey um, done and one out of 10 out of a thousand girls in the UK said they missed school due to their period being a direct result of unable to afford access to sanitary products. So, you know, it, it's making a, a huge impact on uh, women's education and their future career. Moving on to the actual menstrual cycle, the first two weeks of your cycle, you're, you're full of energy, you've got good levels of estrogen. Um, There's the second part of the cycle after you release, release uh, a fol uh, an egg from the follicle, um, where you develop something called the corpus luteum which then um, produces and pumps out progesterone. And that can make you sleepy, less switched on, um, bloated, um, more edematous in the body. And, and you know, your concentration levels may not be as good. And you, you generally sleep more and eat more um, high sugar food, which, which can also then impact your sugar controls and your, your energy levels. Um, some women suffer from hugely debilitating PMS symptoms, and this could be environmental or um, it could be genetically um, impacted from a per woman, uh, personal woman's experience. Um, so there's so many factors that can influence a woman's cycle. Um, and, you know, taking the contraceptive pill, you know, you, we think, yes, you know, this is this is this is this is a, this is the solution. But actually, it may sometimes it, it works as a band aid to suppress the connection with the brain and the ovaries, rather than getting to the root cause of the imbalance. And you may think it's the answer, but actually, there's more and more evidence becoming available about the post pill depletion syndrome as um, as illustrated by Dr. Jolene Brighton. And would you believe there was actually a male contraceptive study in 2016 that was abandoned due to the male side effects, which ironically were no less than the side effects that a woman had already endured during the contraceptive pill. 
Um, moving on quickly to um, menopause, you know, Sophia mentioned about urinary incontinence, loads of issues going on here, and some women never recover from that. And can you imagine the impact of, you know, going to work and not being able to go to work or go outside because you need to um, go to the loo? And there's good evidence for some um, that safe, safe treatment like radiofrequency that's not available in national health. Um, and, you know, can you imagine going through the change and not having the hormones to be able to be switched on and think properly and you're getting the side effects of having no hormones like hot flashes and um, tiredness, urinary incontinence as you get older. And, you know, the HRT is available. Did you know that estrogen has 400 metabolic functions in the body, including protecting the brain from Alzheimer's? Um, so in today's, in today's world, this, this, this should be way more out there for women for education and more studies we can't depend on pharmaceutical companies to come up with the answer or the governments to lead the way we need to do improvement you know improve this now we need to improve to improve the system now um, and fund this so that we can lead that way that is exactly the reason why i started this whole movement so that we can address issues that governments aren't doing so our next guest is uh, justine southall justine was the managing director of mary claire and cosmopolitan magazine for many many years she has over three decades of experience in the media justine so with our uh, last three guests we have explored all the biological aspects of being a woman from here on we are now going to go into the realm of environmental factors Factors. And in particular, we are going to look at culture now. So at its core, when we talk about culture, we, uh, it's all about family, right? This family is the smallest unit of a society. Can you share some of your observations from so many years of working with Mary Claire Cosmopolitan? What are some of the relationships between family and society at large? And how does that impact women's uh, career and socioeconomic impact? Thanks, Tony. So, I mean, that's a lot. And um, I, I have spent uh, my entire career running businesses with female audiences. I've worked primarily with female colleagues and I'm also a working mother. So I'm talking very much from my own experience and observations over that time. And 20 years ago, in fact, my husband, Hussein, told his then directors that he could not be posted away for six months to run a job because his wife had a career and we had young children. Now, consequently, um, his career career progression was to become a little less, uh, 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 just became more difficult. Um, so he left, he retrained as a teacher, and that enabled me to continue my career, kept it on track at a key point. Now, this was 20 years ago, but actually, the idea that women are primarily responsible for family life and childcare, and men pursue their careers at all costs is still prevalent, and these ideas hold women back. Now, these deep gender biases about male and female roles are consciously and unconsciously reinforced in the home from childhood onwards. And in the UK right now, women spend on average twice as much time as men on childcare and three, three times as much time on housework um, as their male partners. And I've seen this in my own teams over the years, and, you know, it's exhausting. So these are still issues for women's progress, but let's be clear, they are not women's issues. Now, these are societal issues. They are issues for women and men and families. We lose 54,000 women from the UK workforce annually because they've had a baby and a lot of this is around a lack of affordable childcare and a resistance to work flexibility in many organisations. And the fact is that uh, there are many men, many men who feel they cannot request different ways of working either for fear of their career being penalized as it is the case for many women incidentally um, when they do. So male peer group pressure can also be a huge deterrent. So we need to build behavioral attitudinal and then actual change. And I think with more women then continuing to build their careers, staying in the work arena, we'll have a better chance of women reaching those leadership roles. Now, we have an opportunity to accelerate change right now, I think, because of COVID. Yes, we know that actually lockdown has for many women reinforced uh, traditional gender roles negatively, despite both men and women working from the home. But there is a counterpoint, and that, and that is this, that many men have also realized the 
positive benefits of being at home. Uh, more time, less time commuting, more time with their families and, and any other realm of benefits that that's brought. So they're not going to go back. And actually, um, whilst affordable childcare is still an issue, either at home or in an office, there is a shift coming. And the younger generations who have different life aspirations and expectations um, won't work the way that we have been working historically and organizations ignore all of this at their peril. So we have a false behavioral change. This now needs a concurrent attitudinal shift um, that does not penalize women or men for wanting to work differently. And in turn, this will help to equalize the gender pay gap and opportunity gap that we still have. We have a better chance. Business can no longer say that flexible or agile working is not possible. COVID-19 and technology made it so, and the savings to be made on offices can be reinvested into businesses, and that will mean this carries on way beyond this crisis. Um, from the media point of view, social platforms that can be very powerful tools in influencing behavior, lobbying for change, and so does this moment give us an opportunity to build momentum around work equality and the positive benefits for employees, productivity and profitability. Thank you so much, Justine. That was uh, so eye-opening and very valid point. So we now have a Laura Birkenberg. Laura's work is very interesting to me because she focuses on education and income and earning and uh, the societal realities that affect women's economic outlook. One uh, very key point that Laura mentioned to me when we were talking in preparation for this was uh, women's attitude towards finance and wealth management. So uh, as somebody who is the CEO of the Catalyst Center and helps companies to build brand capital market, and also as an adjunct professor who teaches a graduate course on new venture feasibility, which is also ranked, by the way, number 10 out of 2,600 plus entrepreneurship program. Well done, Laura. So, uh, so she's going to talk to us about women's financial literacy and uh, their attitude towards money. Thanks, Somi. Um, welcome, everybody. As a business owner, educator, and investor in startups, there are typically very few female investors in the room. So the question becomes, how can we change that narrative? So as we've heard today from other speakers, there are multiple nature and nurture factors that affect women's financial literacy and economic power. Things like Somi mentioned, education, income and earning ability, income disparity and societal realities of, of motherhood and unpaid care. But if we look through the self lens and we see that women's orientation around money tends to be focused around earnings and a living budget and less around financial planning and investing, yet true wealth accumulation is more of a function of putting your money to work for you. So there's a need to redirect the focus. So what I'm talking about today is not a one size off solution. We have to meet people where they are in their financial continuum. So to do so, we've got three ways to help bridge that gap and increase financial literacy. The first one being education. So as we know, investment in knowledge always pays dividends. On average, a woman today earns between 80 and 82 cents for every dollar a man earns over a lifetime. This really adds up. So to change the financial trajectory, everyone must first learn to kind of crawl, walk, and then run. And so ways to do that include things like free online classes on lynda.com or are used tools, to pay, uh, tools for pay transparency like Payscale educate yourself, um, take an entrepreneurship course. It teaches the core disciplines of business building and investing. Another way is to build your social capital on platforms like LinkedIn. And lastly, we all have to remember, we do have a choice in buying from companies that have your values at heart. Women can vote with their wallets on who they want to support. A second way is build a pipeline for success. You know, power is gained by sharing knowledge, not by hoarding it, right? So what our female investor group started doing is inviting the next generation to the table. So when our startup investors listen to business pitches, what we've also done is invited the next gen to the room as well. What it does is it brings diversity of thought while providing a chance to educate, to mentor, to inform and include. It truly creates that pipeline for future success. Women are more likely to support a charity but we can also support an entrepreneur to grow the economic prosperity of both people and communities. 
again, we have to meet people where they are. If you can't invest today, you can certainly advocate on social media for women and women-owned small businesses. And third, be and see the change. We can't be afraid of the future. We have to build it. Women now drive the world economy. Globally, women control about 20 million in annual consumer spending and account for 85% of consumer purchases, according to Harvard Business Review. But rarely do we find women leading these companies. The next generation truly needs the ability to visually see oneself in positions of economic power in the workplace, social media, movies, advertising. So if we continue to meet people where they are in the continuum of money, a rising tide will lift all boats. So keep in mind, the end goal isn't just about more money, but the end goal is living a life on your own terms. So to gain financial literacy, we must remember the clearer the mission, the higher the margin. And our mission today is to educate, build a pipeline, and go out and be and see that change. Thank you, Somi. Thank you, Laura. That was great. Speaking of money, so our next guest, Andy Crummer, is a lawyer. And I have a question for Andy. Andy, you are somebody who has worked as a partner in an international law firm. You are a great advocate of gender equality. You're a speaker, you're an author, and a champion for women's leadership. So can you tell me, Andy, why is it that women have historically been earning less money than men, and nobody has really raised their voice about that, or maybe they have, okay, recently in the, in the recent years. But one of my biggest questions, I, I just really can't get my head around the fact that this is legally has been even possible. How is that possible? So I will leave that with you to, uh, to give us some insights. Okay, well, uh, this actually ties together with the um, discussions of the doctors, uh, as well as uh, uh, bo both of the, the Justines and uh, uh, the, the one that we just heard. Um, basically, what happens is that historically, women and men are perceived to operate in totally different spheres. And in a public sphere for men, in the domestic sphere for women. And that hurts women when we move into the workplace. Because what happens is people can have enormous hostility to women at work, uh, both intentional discrimination, but also implicit unintentional bias that somehow women's participation is seen as less valuable we're less competent, we're, we're not worth as much is what, the, what this is about. And these biases affect women um, in three different ways of bias, affinity bias, and this was mentioned at the beginning about how people are more comfortable with people who are like them. We have gender bias where it's believed by both men and women that men are somehow better at workplace skills and leadership roles than women, and also social identity bias, which is that um, uh, we come to the workplace with different uh, characteristics, racial, ethnic, um, religious, uh, uh, what school did you go to, all sorts of things. And the results from these biases is that women earn less, we don't advance as far or as fast as men do, we don't get um, uh, the same sorts of flexibility that we might need for our schedules as is evident by the presentations of the doctors and the physiological uh, differences that women have. And so we need to get more women into senior leadership roles. And um, I would propose in the minute I have left, a uh, seven-step program to try to eliminate bias in the workplace. And I, this is based on a um, uh, uh, seven-step program that I have uh, set out in my book, It's Not You, It's the Workplace. The first one is about information. And Somi, that's actually what you've been talking about and what this is all about today and um, in your work generally, which is that we have to get information. Information is powerful, but it's not enough. What we need to do is we have to find a way to break through the policies and the procedures that treat women as if somehow we're second class citizens. Um, uh, the blind auditions, the way that symphony orchestras now pick um, 
uh, the performers so that they do it behind a screen and so that the, uh, the judges are not able to determine whether the person playing the, the piano is a woman or a man. Slow thinking, which Daniel Kahneman uh, in his, in his um, Nobel Prize winning work, Thinking Fast and Slow, that if we think slow, we don't think with our gut, we think with more objectives. And so by eliminating discretion and providing flexible schedules, not just to women, but to men too, because as has been pointed out already, this is family issues. We really need to be sure that it is something that can go um, for men and for women. And we need to get more men to support what women are doing and to support women in leadership roles. I've always found this topic fascinating as somebody who grew up in a very underprivileged background. So women's empowerment, I've always believed women need to have money. They need to make their own money. All right, so um, our next guest. So speaking of money, we are still on the topic of economy, but we are um, kind of uh, going a little bit into the realm of popular culture too with our next guest. Because when we talk about the economic empowerment, people often think about banks and financial institutions. But one of the biggest sources of financial value generation is the film industry, which is really ironic because um, you know, the film industry is quite happy to have women on screen. But when it comes to behind the screen, you know, the dire directors, writers, and, and producers are not very often women. The film industry acts as a double-edged sword because both it impacts the economy and it impacts the culture. So Kerry Fulton is going to talk to us about that. Kerry is the founder of Evenfield Entertainment. It's a company that finances and produces films by women with an ambition to balance the popular culture. Kerry, can you please tell us why in 2020, only 15% of films are written and directed by women? What does this mean for our society and for women's economic and cultural status? Sure. Hi, Tomi, and thank you for organizing this. This is fascinating. I'm learning a lot from a lot of other people. So, um, we are conditioned to believe we choose what we watch, read, and listen to. However, the media now is more consolidated than ever previously in history. In America, six companies have control over 90% of the content we consume, and five of these companies are run by men. What audiences see on screen has a both a macro and micro effect on our society. Only one female director and 12 female writers have ever won an Oscar and several million people globally watch the Oscars. The content industry is worth $100 billion and is consumed globally. Yet according to the 2020 UCLA Hollywood Diversity Report, only 17.4% of screenwriters are women and 15% of directors are women. Media affects the way young women interact with others and their ability to perform in the professional world. The perspective of the stories and and the stories we see online, on TV and in cinemas matter. On an individual level, the way which girls and women are sexualized and under-intellectualized in the media increasingly, increasingly affects our self-image in the real world. In 2016, Slated.com analyzed 1,600 films and found that there is a systemic lack of trust for female filmmakers. Decisions about what types of films to make, how large a budget to assign to them, and how they will be marketed, and who will helm or direct them, are made in Hollywood executive suites. In early 2020, these decisions continue to be dominated by white men at the 11 major and mid-major studios. And bias is expressed in two crucial ways. Less budget is given to female filmmakers and distribution and marketing spend is three times less than men with the same budget and genre of film. This creates a perception that female filmmakers are less successful. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, really. Yet a CAA study in 2018 showed that films by female filmmakers outperform men across all budget levels. So how do we fix this? I think the biggest thing is more access to financing, financing for projects and financing for companies that champion women. If we go in with financing, they'll generally take the meeting. We need to be cognizant of the biases in the country in the current distribution models, and we need to leverage the new distribution models, 
created by new technologies to disseminate female driven stories. We are seeing this happen at a grassroots level, but no significant financing scheme has been put in place yet. The stories we consume define us as culture and provide a lens through which we interact with the world. Creating stories can change culture and popular culture impacts and influences everything. Mm -hmm. That's why I set up in Evenfield Entertainment to help level the playing for women's arena. Our next guest is actually going to talk about politics, but we will see how women's lack of economic power is also impacting their ability to participate in the political sphere. So our next guest is Natalie Klein. She is a computational linguist. She's also a Democratic nominee for U.S. Congress in West Virginia's first district. So when we look at world leaders, even in our modern time, we see that men are still in the majority of the leadership positions. So Natalie, uh, can you tell us what are some of the barriers of entry for women in the traditional political landscape? And also, most importantly, most interestingly, as a computational linguist, can you tell us, do you see some kind of opportunity here for women to use technology to break through some of the traditional structures in politics? I would love that. Yes, thank you so much for having me on today. Um... Yeah, women, we face a multitude of barriers upon entering the traditional political landscape. Uh, for this conference, I'll be focusing on what I consider to be the largest barrier to entry. And I'm calling that moneyed incumbency. Um, it's not incumbency in its truest form that we know it, but money certainly continues to rule the roost. Most current representatives in the United States are men. Being an incumbent makes it easier to win an election, but that's not necessarily because of name recognition. An incumbent spends their tenure working with lobbyists who donate to their campaigns in exchange for beneficial legislation. And this is a nearly impossible financial hurdle to overcome for new candidates. Once a politician is no longer seeking public office, they may gift their campaign funds to other candidates and PACs. And most incumbents will donate that money to PACs who support candidates they would like to see mirror their own choices and ideologies in office. And this frequently translates into hundreds of thousands of dollars in startup funds, or what I call trickle down money to incumbency. If a candidate is projected to win their race or is running in a swing state, then the national political parties will come in and help that candidate fundraise. But if neither one of those things is the case, they're likely to not receive any fundraising help or be able to access a lot of party resources. And this lack of resources across the majority of American states will continue to perpetuate these moneyed incumbency advantages, limiting the amount of female representation. In the US, candidates do not receive pay or benefits, so very few people can afford to campaign full time. If a woman is not wealthy or work a very flexible job, it's nearly impossible for her to afford the staff that she needs or even spend the 60 plus hours per week building her campaign from the ground up. There have been many moments where I wished I had technology colleagues or virtually meet with a mentor or a liaison to talk about messaging. We can create a network that helps women at both the local and national level access resources and actually combat this moneyed incumbency. Technology can help us combat data loss from previous cycles and candidates and build upon our knowledge. Through technology, we can provide mentorship programs, connect women with resources, partner with groups to negotiate costs, and create technology that disseminates information. And as a network, we can use that collective voice to put pressure on elected officials, speak for women as a group, and push for equality. So I know I am committed to being a mentor to future female candidates and using my technology background to help work towards the development of low cost technology for women who are fighting for equal representation. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much, Natalie. The subject of technology is very close to my heart. Many of you probably know that I'm a tech philosopher. What really concerns me is the lack of presence of women in technology, especially in the decision making area, which is why I invited Toju, who is our next speaker, Toju Duke. Um, she works in Google and we use Google for everything for our business. I don't know what, how life would have been without Google, but I would really love to see some women up there driving these technologies. 
So Tochu is a Google product lead for Europe and Middle East and Africa. Um, and she's also a machine learning fairness program manager. This is a fascinating topic to me. Um, she works closely with women um, and she's going to uh, share her experience. So, so Tochu, can you tell us as somebody who works uh, who has worked uh, for Google, you know, at, at, at the level that you have, why is it that we don't see women in the top tier uh, of decision making in technology? And how can we go about changing this narrative? I'm happy to be here, Somi, and thanks again for doing this. This is amazing. Um, I'll just start off with the overall journey of a woman's life, and I'm not going to go into the menstruation and all of that because I'm not a doctor and uh, experts here have already um, mentioned that. But overall, um, looking at starting from high school, right? Um, there's gender stereotypes where girls, there's this thing about girls not going to do well in STEM courses. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And that gender stereotype affects girls even from studying STEM courses in universities. And data shows it that a lot of girls have dropped off from universities as well from, from STEM courses due to these gender stereotypes. So this is the beginning of the whole journey affecting you know, the pool of women in tech. Now let's fast track to after university, the, there's now a lack of talent pool um, because most girls are not even qualified to enter tech. And then now we have more male recruiters in tech who will probably go through in-group favoritism, which is a form of bias and it's been mentioned already by some of our speakers, um, where they'll, they'll tend to hire people who, are more, who look more like them and act more like them and speak more like them which will be more men. And that reduces the pie. And then for the few women who now make it into these tech companies, 73% of them believe that it's a very sexist culture because it's full of other men. Um, so women tend to feel isolated. There's lack of sponsorship and networking um, opportunities there, lack of role models, because a lot of women are not in tech. And that's why we're here, right? And Added to that, 53% of women believe that there's a major gender pay gap in tech industries, um, in the tech industry. And a lot of tech companies right now are trying to break through that. So the top tech companies are trying to make sure that, you know, they bridge the gender gap, pay, pay gap. But this is still very prevalent in the tech industry. Um, the last but not the least really is, you know, inflexible um, job work, work opportunities. So women get pregnant and um, the maternity leaves um, are very short. They don't feel welcome to come back to the, to the workplace. Um, so we have about 45% of women who drop out from tech in the first year um, after the maternity leaves. Um, this makes it a very small pie. So how do we tackle this and how do we address this? I think it's just re reversing the curve. Uh, we need to break down the gender stereotypes. Um, we need to make sure that women feel that they are okay to go into tech. They feel, you know, they belong to tech. There was a memo that came out in Google a couple of years ago, which still showed, showed this gender stereotype. Um, a guy wrote something about women and, you know, not being, I don't, I don't want to go through it in too much detail, but again, it just showed that men do not see women as on par to go into tech. We definitely need more, more role models. We need more, more people like Ruth Porat, who's the CFO of Google or, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, um, who is the CEO of um, Facebook, or we need more people like Ellen Powell, who is the CEO of Reddit. Um, but the only way we can have these people is if they stay in the companies, right? Like, you know, we need to build some form of resilience. Uh, we need to build more networking, networking opportunities, more sponsorship opportunities, um, so that the women who finally make it into tech do not drop out and do not, do not, not, do not um, get laid off um, when, when we want to have babies and kids, they don't get discouraged about it. Um, if we think of the, of the engineers in tech as well. So when we talk about tech, it, you don't have to be an engineer to get into a tech company. I'm not an engineer right now. Um, I work in a, in a go-between role between, you know, the engineering teams and the sales teams. Um, but if you want to be an engineer, great. We have 20% of women in tech are engineers right now. And again, it's, it's down to the culture. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. Um, a lot of breakdowns that need to be done. It's going to be a very long process. Um, it's something that will take a while. But I think I really believe that if we come together and develop different um, opportunities, different groups, they, I, I mean, that's why we're here today, different groups and different opportunities, this will actually be broken down. So now we have, uh, can we bring, yeah, uh, there you go. We have Andy Simon. 
Andy, so we have heard a lot about both the cultural aspects, the biological aspects, but when it comes to co corporations, a lot of corporations are now saying that they are championing women to be in the forefront, but for some reason, they are unable to make that change. Now, as somebody who has worked as a corporate ant anthropologist, and um, Andy, as somebody who has worked as a uh, executive in large corporations for many years, and you have worked with both entrepreneurs, uh, and now you, you're working as a consultant and award-winning author and speaker. Can you tell us in your work with companies, what it is you're finding from your experience that is holding them back from making that meaningful change? Oh, Sami, this is such a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. And, and we are corporate anthropologists and specialize in helping organizations change. So what have we found? A couple of things from the neurosciences and the social sciences that are very relevant to the whole program here. The first thing is you have to understand that the brain takes data and creates a story about it. Whether you're a large corporation, an entrepreneur, a professional, you have a story in your mind that creates the illusion of a reality. And so all of the discussion today about change, it's important to understand how are we going to change the story that you believe to be true. The only truth is there's no truth. So you have this reality and you go with others from a cultural point of, of, of view and you want to be with others who share your same story. The problem with it is that you don't see anything that doesn't fit that story directly. You're the hero in the story and anything else your amygdala hijacks. Now what we've learned about the brain is that men have very large amygdalas and they flee, fear, battle, fight, appease before they collaborate. Women have a brain with a very large hippocampus, much larger than a man's, and they are very much into oxytocin. Oxytocin is a love hormone. So now we go back to our visualization. If we're gonna change an organization, they have to change how they visualize themselves. The story has to be a new one. And it's fascinating because what the brain does with the imagined story is it begins to believe it's the real story. So as everybody's talking, I'm thinking about how do we change the story in corporations, so they begin to see women in a new way. They already have all those biases, so we have to create a new story. And when we do that, it becomes the future view of where we're going. Humans are futurists. We're homo prospectus. We wanna see what's coming next so we can live today. And we're very distrustful of things we don't know. So then comes the next part, which is small wins. And then we have to begin to recognize that those wins have metrics that say, ah, this is where we're going and it'll get us there. The second thing that we've learned is that from our neuroscience and our social sciences is that we live conversations. The conversations we have are extremely important to how our brain operates. If you say the word I, your um, amygdala puts out a lot of cortisol. It's not very, it's not very conducive to working together you're very aggressive with each other, and you're not sure you're really trusted, which is why when companies say we're going to change and people say, I'm not going to change, you can change anything, but I'm not doing, they're, they're responding to the words you're using. But if we use the word we, and we co-create, trust builds, oxytocin is created. And if you can hear a theme here, is that women have the ability to see things through a different lens. And if we can visualize a different company, we can also begin to live that company and have different conversations within it. So as you're thinking about how you're gonna do this, you need to think about we, not I, and about a story that you're going to tell over and over again to see the new. And then you need to celebrate. In the United States, there are 400,000 women attorneys, 40% of them, 65% of the accountants are women. Over half the doctors are women, over half the dentists are women, more than half the people in college are women. There's a tsunami coming. You don't necessarily need role models who are the C-suites, but we're working hard together with the Women's Business Collaborative to begin to move more women into those C-suites. And as that happens, we're working on a movement. This is a moment. The moment has momentum and there's a movement coming where women can change the way we see the world and we work together. Women are great at collaborating, coordinating, communicating and creating because we are different and that's okay but we need to build those bonds with men so we get the pay, the position and the power that we're looking for to have parity and begin to change the world that we're in. It's a good time to embrace this, but you're also going to have to have celebrations of the results 
And those Oscars are important because it says something about how we see women in a world that's very public. The more rituals we have where women become the heroes or the heroines. I've written a lot about the pandemic and that's what becomes real important here. So let me tell you about Sara, who is also a great friend of mine. And I'm a big fan of her book, The Shed Method. She's an executive coach. What's really interesting about Sarah's work is that she teaches us how to harness our own energy how to create positive change. And uh, she's, uh, you know, an award-winning executive coach, as I mentioned, uh, and works regularly with leaders. So, uh, sir, can you tell us from the work that you've done, especially with women, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that women face, especially when you work with leaders? Thanks, Somi. Um, and yes, again, reiterate, thank you to everyone who's spoken. It's been really interesting. So um, I'd say the first thing that we can focus on is controlling our controllables. So when facing challenge, it's easy to focus on what we can't control. Um, and we've heard many reasons of, of, of reasons why we uh, of, of reasons why we can't control things. But the people that I see succeed in challenging situations are deliberate about focusing on what they can control. So the female leaders I coach, and actually men too, <laughs> invest time and effort in building habits to manage their energy. Our energy is a huge resource, but it runs out so that we have to be deliberate about what we spend it on. So keep asking, where does my energy matter most for the impact I want to create? Whatever environment we're operating in, when, when we're unsure as humans, when we're unsure or we're anxious, we often retreat to familiar habits. So habits that may not serve our cause or our ambition. So how we lead ourselves is key. And, and that's what I work with on leaders, supporting them to build habits that serve their ambition. And recently, um, a female leader in a tech firm said, you need two things, Sarah, when you operate in a predominantly male tech world, a strong female network and a huge dose of self-belief. And but the thing is, you see, building that self-belief requires discipline and effort. Uh, the science tells us that to perform at our best under pressure or in high challenge situations, it requires us to practice outside of pressure. Um, the gold medal winning women's GB hockey team, for example, had a practice called Winning Thursday, which was a whole day to repeatedly practice skills for high pressure scenarios. So it's vital to anticipate and practice the challenge so that when it happens, we're less reliant on impulse and better supported by habits to perform at our very best. So the key is to work out what habits work for you. So everyone's different, but the top resilience practices that I witness making the most difference are these. Connect to a leadership purpose. That doesn't mean you have to be a leader, but it's a purpose that leads you. Ask yourself, what impact do I want to cause rather than how will I be perceived? Um, a purpose beyond self-interest can power up the will to be braver. And again, to quote the hockey team again, theirs was um, be the difference, inspire others and make history. To connect to that. Secondly, stay forward focused. Notice what's working. We often focus on what's not working. Notice what's working. Keep track of your success stories, share them and get feedback on when you're at your very, very best. And rather than ask what you don't want, ask for what you want in order to support your conditions for success and know what they are for you. In my experience, we as women can fail to define what those conditions actually are. We need to be specific and have ways to boss your brain. So under pressure, as we just heard from Andy, it's easy to fall back on impulses. They're faster and our choices that we make benefit from a moment of deliberation. Um, and I, I, I like the example of Sabrina Cohen Hatton. She's a great example in the UK for men and women in the emergency services. Uh, and they have a self-talk that makes you pause, clarify your impact and intent, and then get into bold action. Five. Build support network, networks. Uh, Toji mentioned those, I think it's really important. Seek out sponsors and mentors, both male and female. And finally, build strong refuel habits. Everything that I've just talked about takes effort and energy. And so it's essential that we look after ourselves, uh, what I would call shed basics, sleep, hydration, exercise, and diet, so that we have the fuel that we need to put in the effort. And finally, I'll finish on the education. Many people have mentioned it, but how can we better build resilience practice into the school curriculum? Teach our girls how to lead themselves, encourage courage and resilience so they can confidently enter the world of business and technology in their way. So those would be a few things to start us off.
so much, Sarah. That was so helpful. And I found your book incredibly helpful too. So uh, let's have a look at a Q&A, um, uh, the questions and answers. Uh, and let's see, look at. So so, uh, so one question here we have. So this question is for Dr. Bartlish. What is the best way to increase access to, to quality health care um, for women? Uh, and uh, she's asking as somebody who lives in the U.S. where there is no health care, you know, universal health care. That's sort of a complicated uh, answer to the question. So access to healthcare is obviously on the forefront of everyone's mind right now, and there's a lot of debate on how to do it. And you know, the, the, the short answer to a very a long issue is that one of the things in the United States system is that it is so incredibly difficult, time consuming and expensive to even become a physician. There's also a lot of bureaucracy with insurance companies. There's a lot of um, non-information, misinformation, lack of information. So there's a couple of different ways that we have barriers. Um, one is that cost is always a significant issue. Um, coverage is a secondary issue and it's constantly evolving and becoming more and more challenging right now. But there's also the issue of education. And so there's a couple of different reasons why people might not have access. Part of it is whether you have the right insurance or you can afford things that you might have to do outside of insurance. But part of it is also just knowing where to go. So some of the examples that I gave have a very unique characteristic in that you might actually be able to access that care if you even knew that it existed or you knew to ask the right questions. So I think the first step is to sort of attack that part of it in terms of increasing information and education in purposeful ways. Um, to draw on what some of the other physicians were talking about, for example, with the birth control pill, you know. I can remember for a very long time, a lot of people I knew taking the pill, and I don't think anyone ever had a real conversation about it or about you know, what the pros and cons were to even make an educated guess. Some of the issues I brought up in terms of women having access to rehabilitation after pregnancy, those systems don't even exist and they're not pointed in the right direction. So if you separate out the economic issues from the misinformation issues, you can realize that there's really two different ways to target it. Some is policy change, which has its own challenges, and some can really be resolved by just having the right information platforms and directing patients and women to those platforms so they can demand from the healthcare industry what they need and then have the choice of what they want and how to access it. So I think you have to separate those two challenges. But I found in general in, in most of healthcare and specifically in plastic surgery, when the information is there and it's a patient driven uh, initiated question and demand, the system tends to respond. So that's, in my opinion, the best way to get the ball rolling. So um, Shirai, so she's saying that um, she has asked uh, a, her organization, provided the data, provided the how, provided the who for the board, and she cannot get a momentum needed, uh, the momentum that's needed. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so I think that's a brilliant question. Um, I think you have to appeal to where the money's at. So if your organization has donors, you can start a uh, online national petition or international petition to publicly out and humiliate if you wanna go that way, or you can go internally and look up who are the board members, and then you can also go from the legislative um, aspect. I know that some countries actually mandate that 50% of boards are staffed by women and California recently passed a law that all boards and companies beyond a certain size must have at least one. But I would love to see a world where at least 50% of those of us with uteri on every board represented everywhere. And that is a quick way to increase it. And then if you're a CEO of a company or on the board, you can suggest and request this. And this is actually what a male ally did. He joined a huge national company and he said, my goal here is to at least, actually he had a different approach, that at the for any major C-suite or major position, that there will always be a woman candidate out of the final two. So I think that is a huge thing that you yourself can implement. And if people say, oh, there's no one qualified, as we all know, that's just a lie. There are binders full of women and lots of lists such as board list, or um, I believe All Raise has also come up with a list of speakers. We will all happily help you find women for any board that you want anytime.
Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was very helpful. A question for Leah. Amy asks, is asking, what are some of the environmental interventions that an individual can do to decrease the frequency of their uh, menstruation and lengthen their cycle? It depends on the root cause of the problem. And uh, women have short cycles depending on what's going on. If you have a high stress environment, that's going to have a knock on effect to your hormones so the hormones are, are like a finely tuned symphony and if one hormone is out of place it will have a knock-on a cascade effect on your other hormones so if you are really really stressed or if you're not sleeping properly then that could influence your cycles and it could make them shorter um, so you must get your foundations of health right so you must be sleeping well and eight hours is the magic number, drinking plenty of water, optimizing your detox pathways. So making sure that you're perspiring regularly, um, you're breathing. So when you're very stressed, some people do breath, uh, breath hold and actually breathing is one of um, the detoxification pathways and, and eating good, nutritious, balanced food, plenty of veggies, especially the cruciferous range, um, which are your cauliflower, your bok choy, um, your broccoli, your cabbage, and they all help with estrogen detoxification, um, with a liver liver function as well. Um, so there's there's a lot a lot that you can do to balance your hormones. And if you're still getting short cycles, then it's it's understanding why you have that um, that short cycle. And the only way is really to test your your hormone metabolites or a um, a, a um, saliva testing, which is not available usually on national healthcare. And it depends how old you are, how young you are, what the likely causes are, it depends what symptoms you're getting, that you can maybe make a clinical judgment. Um, you could be deficient in progesterone. So if you're, if you're not producing enough progesterone in the second part of your cycle, it could be that you're um, having a corpus luteum failure. So you're not producing that progesterone and you're lacking it and then your cycles are shorter. Um, or it could be that your follicular stage, which is the beginning stage, is shorter. So, it's, you know, it, it very much depends on you and also how your genetics is working and how you're influenced by your environment. That's not your just nutrition, but also household chemicals, fluoride, chlorine and, um, you know, products, cleaning products, plastics, BPA. There's so much out there, so much information. Thank you so much, Ilya. That was very helpful. I have the question right here. So the question was, in 2018, then Governor Jerry Brown signs a bill that required companies in California to have a certain number of women on their boards. How big of a difference do quotas make in regard to the treatment of women in corporations? That's really a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me, because there's been uh, some litigation uh, around the um, enforceability or the legality of um, uh, of quotas, but the reality is that in Europe we've seen quotas very effective, and so what we what we need to do is that's one way to address the issue. I um, have written an article uh, in the in Forbes uh, magazine, uh, Forbes.com, uh, about the problems that we have with the board of directors and the fact that we're never going to be able to have a, a fair number of women on boards if we just let things go at the rate that they are. And so whether it's going to be quotas or uh, other requirements, we really do need to see some changes in order to have women represented on boards and in senior leadership positions. Hi, um, th this question is from Suswati Basu. Um, how do women get into leadership positions in technology? Um, I feel it's not a direct journey to it. Um, I feel, you know, once you're in tech, stay there. That That's my first thing is building that resilience. We know that the culture is really sexist and we know that there are lots of um, policies that are not favor favorable to women. Um, but I'll say, you know, if, the, if you're working for a company that is not really great, um, they don't have good policies towards women, it's not a top, one of the top tech companies, you know, navigate your way out of there, but stay within tech. If you want to get into a senior position in, in tech, then stay within there. Um, the next thing will be around sponsorship and networking and finding a mentor. When you see someone else who looks like you and speaks like you, it, it keeps you encouraged um, and you can, uh, you're able to share, you know, your pains, your challenges, your career path, what you want to do, and you get the right feedback that you need. Um, so that's another thing. I think another thing to, to do as well is just make sure you're really good at what you do. It's really important. That, um, 
to be excellent at what you do. Understand what it is that you hate and stay away from it. So that when they're talking about you, you know, when you're meant to get promoted during calibration sessions, when they're talking about you, they have something good to say. And I think, you know, if you just stick with it, be very strategic, find the right role models and the right mentors, you know, expand your network. Um, if you're in a place and it's not working for you, get out of it, but stay within the same industry. With time, you will finally get to that position. Great. Thank you so much, Toju. So we're coming towards the end of our um, session tonight. It's been absolutely amazing to have you guys here. Just before you all leave, I want to tell you very quickly about a platform that um, we've been building with my team to uh, essentially address all of these issues. So there's, uh, there's going to be um, several um, segments to it. You will be able to uh, fund, uh, raise funds. You will be able to um, uh, sh show your talent. You know, because most of the time when I talk about um, uh, this, these issues with uh, um, people who are working in um, large corporations, they tell me uh, that um, we would love to hire more women, but we can't find um, you know female talent. And they, and they say that. Um, when we put uh, a uh, when we put out um, you know a, a job description, we can't specifically say we want more women to apply. So I wanted to address that issue by creating it. So the the um, uh, platform I'm building is is called Fem Talent, and I wanted to uh, create a place where women could uh, raise investment, uh, where uh, women could be found, um, discovered as talent, whether it's as uh, consultants, whether it's as speakers, as, um, you know, full-time uh, full-time uh, full workers, um, and uh, every, uh, every possible way. Uh, and also another thing is that we will be able to uh, raise funds. So there's going to be a, a section where we can create our own grants. So imagine, for example, if we have 10 million, 100 million, you know, even a million uh, people and everybody uh, decides that there is this cause that we need to focus on. So it seems like looking at the conversations tonight, a lot of it comes back to health issues and and, uh, and the biology segment, which is kind of ironic because uh, some of the people that have been following um, uh, this whole uh, movement that I started a few weeks ago, uh, I have received some criticism. Some people were like, why are you going there? Why are you talking about biology? But looking at the conversation tonight, what's becoming really, uh, 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 really uh, obvious is that it really does all start with biology. And uh, I'll tell you a very, very quick story. When I was a kid, I was growing up in Tehran, in Iran. Uh, you know, it's a Muslim country. And of course, um, you know, I, I'm now an atheist. But at that time, my mom used to say, say to me that as a woman, you're not allowed to go into a mosque uh, when you have your period. And that was the point that was like, you know, what, so that's where that was the point that I kind of thought biology, that's the thing, you know, that's the thing that's that's keeping me away, even from, you know, if you if somebody believed in God, even from, you know, that sort of place of worship. So so it's been in uh, religion, it's been in, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, politics, economy, every everywhere. So I really do believe these are things that we need to address. And then um, from there going into financial literacy. Uh, so there's going to be an investment hub, there's going to be a, a training a, a learning hub. Uh, so we can have hopefully people like Laura coming in, you know, teaching courses on financial literacy, and specifically for women so that we can create these courses, create these. Uh, there's also going to be a marketplace where women can design and sell their own products. I would have loved to show you the platform tonight. We've been working on it nonstop for the past few weeks, but um, I, I would love to show it to you where when it's a bit more, I, I feel like, you know, it's definitely closer to being ready. So if you're uh, interested in trying it out, you know, you can send me a message. You, you all have my email, somiarian at uh, smartcookiemedia.com and or, uh, you know, send me a message on LinkedIn and uh, I will arrange for you guys to, to go in and have a play around and give me feedback. So I'm building this from the ground up. Uh, we will have these sessions um, I wanted to have it once a month. It's been so much work and I didn't sleep for many nights. So I think that we're going to have these sessions every six weeks. Um, and I expect that our um, community will grow. You know, uh, I, I feel like um, for the next session, I can definitely expect to see at least twice the numbers. And uh, the bigger our community, the more power we have to make an impact. 
Um, if there's anything else, uh, just let me know, guys. But thank you so much. It's been a great success, and I'm so happy to have been able to make it happen. And thank you so much to all of our guests. Thank you for you know for your patience. Uh, I know that it's not been easy. Uh, I'm like I think I'm so high right now. <laughs> like, I probably need to be awake all night. And uh, I'm just so grateful to having all of you guys here. Thank you uh, for um, for making this happen.